This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. Sometimes, after you get what you want, you discover you didn't want what you got. There are inward cravings within the mind and soul which mere materialism can never satisfy. The late comedy star W.C. Fields was a self-educated man who taught himself by prodigious reading. His rendezvous with books began when he realized there was a gap in his education. So Fields put a trunk in his car and drove to the nearest bookstore. He lugged the trunk into the store, opened it, and said to the startled clerk, fill it up. Human beings are possessed of more than physical hunger. There's intellectual curiosity as well. But superseding even this is the inward sense of spiritual craving. Dr. Earl Marsh, clinical professor of medicine at the University of California Medical Center, gave this professional opinion of alcoholism. He stressed that alcoholism has psychological and spiritual connotations. The alcoholic, he said, desperately needs a spiritual feel, a feel for something bigger than he is, to be able to join hands with the out there. There exists a similar spiritual quest within every human being, the quest for God, for truth, for reality, for life. Christ said, I came that you might have, not existence, but life, and have it more abundantly. An anchovy, a cucumber, a pebble, or an earthworm exist. But Christ proclaimed the way to exciting and satisfying life. Again, he said, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be passed a plate of hors d'oeuvres, for they shall be given a bite or two of an appetizer. No, for they shall be filled. There is satisfaction in finding and knowing and serving the living God. Ornithologists have learned that a baby sparrow eats the equivalent of its own weight in food every day. It's a principle of biology. When growth is most rapid, hunger is most intense. This is every bit as true spiritually. I have known people to read religious and philosophical books day and night, literally. 18 and 20 hours a day and ask questions ceaselessly when once their souls have become stirred in this quest for spiritual truth. The most sublimely exhilarating experience in all of human life is spiritual progress. There is a whetted spiritual appetite accompanying it. As Jesus said, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. But to fill your life materially is not necessarily to fulfill your life spiritually. As a boy, I remember I used to delight in a certain brand of cherry-flavored, chocolate-covered nickel candy bar. It seemed to me that the ultimate ecstasy of human life would be to possess a whole box of those and eat them all in one sitting, so at last a friend of mine and I saved up our money, and one Memorable summer day, we did buy a box containing two dozen of them, as well as two quart bottles of strawberry pop. Then, our mouths watering, we sat down on the curb and began voraciously consuming one after another of those cherry-flavored candy bars and washing them down with strawberry soda. Get a grip on your chair. The first three or four were delicious, but by the time we'd finished the top layer of those candy bars... And we're beginning on the second dozen. My friend and I began to suspect the candy manufacturer was guilty of putting the best ones on top because somehow the bottom layer of the box flatly didn't taste the same as the top layer had. Nonetheless, undaunted and resolving to get our money's worth, we went on resolutely devouring those melting chocolate-covered cherry candy bars, now soggy and oozing syrup in the sunshine and swallowing them down with sticky strawberry pop, I may foreshorten the story by remarking we eventually found it convenient to be sitting on a curb near a gutter. Such is the story of humankind coveting, craving things, properties, possessions, pleasures, until, like little boys bloated with too much candy and soda, we weave woefully along only nauseated by what we thought we wanted. A man may think he possesses the best of everything, but until that man finds God, he has neither the best nor everything. The finding and knowing of God are the supreme delights of human life. And in fact, there are literal laws and principles of happiness. Just as surely and certainly as there are laws of physics and principles of chemistry. Why is it, for instance, that the happiest people you know, if you stop to think about it, are also the most loving 
people you know? Why is it the most happy marriages in your experience are the most loving marriages? Is it merely coincidence? Could it be that God created all of humankind to live in this sort of happiness and this sort of love, and only in this does genuine joy lie? It just could be. A woman whose home was swept away by a mudslide during a recent storm in Southern California said to a television interviewer, it took us seven years to build this house the way we wanted it. And it was gone in less than a minute. Material things aren't very important to me now, end of quote. Earthly things are vulnerable. Only spiritual realities are permanent. But what people erroneously call peace of mind is often merely the stuporous torpor achieved by those who surrender their ideals for idleness and lethargy. True peace is spiritual. It is attained not by the relinquishment of ideals, but by the valiant and purposeful living of them. The highest of all ideals is finding and knowing the will of God. You'll sometimes hear it declared that it doesn't matter what you believe in as long as you believe in something, that faith itself is the important thing, and that what you have faith in is of little importance. That's only half true, and two half truths do not equal one truth. Faith is important, but so is that in which one places his faith. Faith in God brings distinctly different results than faith in rabbit's feet, lucky charms, and four-leaf clovers. Faith in God touches ultimate reality, the supreme reality, indeed the source of all reality. Furthermore, God is personal. God can know and be known, love and be loved. And it is this form of faith in a personal, loving, compassionate God with whom you can act and interact which can totally transform your human life, beginning to live as you were born to live, as you were created to live, as it feels right to live, as a son or daughter of God. Conversely, doubt is a serious impediment to spiritual realization. A barnacle, as anybody living near the ocean knows, is a small saltwater shellfish, no bigger than an inch or two, and yet they have to be scraped off the keels of huge ocean-going ships with constantly scheduled regularity because small as they are, they can create so much drag or water resistance that they're able actually to slow down even the most enormous of ships. So it is with little doubts, doubts of the love of God, doubts of the meaning of life. They are capable of slowing progress, Cynicisms are spiritual barnacles to free and forward progress. Therefore, trust God. Listen to this story from history. Alexander the Great once received an anonymous letter that warned that his personal physician, Philip, was planning to poison him. The next time Philip gave Alexander a medicinal potion to drink, the king handed his physician the note, let him read it, then demonstrated his trust in his doctor by draining the cup in one gulp. That is trust. The fervent refusal to believe that the motives of another are anything but the highest. To have faith in God is precisely this sort of trust and more. It's the staunch certainty that God's love is infinite, God's forgiveness eternal, God's will the greatest good in all the universe for you and for everybody else and for every other being and for the entire universe itself. In one cartoon, a little girl says to a boy, you know what your trouble is? The whole trouble with you is you don't understand the meaning of life. The boy says, do you understand the meaning of life? The girl replies, we're not talking about me, we're talking about you. That is literally a life and death question. What is the meaning of life? Listen, this news item appeared in the San Francisco Chronicle, headlined, Girl Bridge Leaper Finally Identified. The young woman who leaped to her death from the Golden Gate Bridge on Saturday was finally identified yesterday as a 25-year-old clerk at Mount Zion Hospital. Ironically, in a case full of irony and coincidences, she was a volunteer worker with the San Francisco Suicide Prevention Center. She herself had been a counselor of people contemplating suicide. Before anyone can be fully capable of assisting another with problems, he or she needs to solve his or her own problems. Time Magazine reports that a Florida psychologist has founded a group called Neurotics Anonymous. At a recent convention, says this article, when a man in his 20s stood up to report that he'd found God again through Neurotics Anonymous, his announcement was greeted calmly. After all, nearly everybody there could say the same thing. Every day, the Neurotics Anonymous member promises himself that, quote, I will criticize not one bit and not try to improve anybody 
except myself. Neurotics Anonymous members are expected to refer their problems to a greater power, preferably, but not necessarily, to God. Their rate of cure for neurotics is an astonishingly high 70%. 70, 70%. Human beings, psychologically and spiritually, crave, yearn for, need a belief in God and the experience of God. There's a yearning for a sense of spiritual orientation in the universe. One familiar form of academic examination in colleges and universities is the identification test, in which a list of names or subjects is given to the student. And his task is then to describe who or what they are. There are brilliant university students who could identify Gautama Siddhartha as the Buddha, Miltiades as a Greek general, Tribonius as a Roman lawyer, and Belsarius as a 6th century general, but who could not identify themselves as sons and daughters of the living God. And that is most vital of all, the discovery of a powerful purpose in being alive. There was one cartoon depicting a man in a business suit standing on a mountaintop and asking a bearded mystic who's sitting cross-legged in meditation, what is the meaning of life? To which the guru replies, if I knew, do you think I'd be sitting up here? How can one specifically go about that task, the finding of a meaning in life, a transcendental purpose? One key technique is the practice of silent prayer and meditation. Quietness is important, vital in the spiritual life. When Toscanini, the great musical conductor, made his debut in New York City, he made an unusual request. He asked that the programs be printed on silk so that the beauty of his music would not be lost in the rustling of the paper. It is written, be still and know that I am God, to discover the tremendous vitality of living as you were born and created to live, as inwardly, interiorly you long to live. Realizing this is a friendly universe and you have a place in it, if only you would dare to believe it, that is as near as the claiming, as near as the having, as near as the experience, right here, right now, this very instant. And then write to us, will you, at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute. The mailing address, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. We want to hear from you. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer. All this literature, yours free, no cost, charge, or obligation. When you write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell that address, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Denham Grimsley saying, May God's will be done by you. Good day.